Well, hello, this is Sandy Tarpinian talking and uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining Amy and I tonight uh, for this series that we're calling Intentional Gardening. We have a reason for that. Um, we're going to try to introduce you to some approaches to gardening that maybe haven't been the way you have thought about gardening or landscaping uh, in the past. And hope that maybe after learning some things tonight that you will reconsider how you look at your landscape and how you look at your garden. Uh, we're gonna give you a little bit of research and easy to understand science on which we have based these approaches. And uh, at, in the next um, series of this, we're going to also give you a lot of information about plants, plant lists, um, places where you can go and buy plants, um, a lot of information also about how to sustain a healthy habitat once you begin to establish it. So that's what's going to happen over the next three, um, three talks that we'll be giving. Tonight we're going to give, um, I want to almost call it a bird's eye view um, of the bigger picture um, of what uh, what are the reasons that you might want to think about getting rid of some of your old habits and really focus on building uh, new habitats. So let's get started. I think most of us don't think very much about what the quarter acre that we live on once looked like. But at one time, this whole area where we live was an extremely robust ecosystem full of plants, insects, birds, uh, other kinds of animals that had learned over centuries to live interdependently and in ways that were very mutually beneficial to, to all of them. But now what has happened is that the populations of birds, plants, and animals in our local ecosystem have become too few in number to perform their vital ecological roles and withstand normal environmental changes. What that means is an, an ability to withstand the kind of changes that we are seeing right now and will probably continue to see in the future with climate change. Of particular interest to us and um, in pick a particular importance to the ecosystem is really what is happening to our endangered pollinators. Uh, there are many, many pollinators um, out there in nature, um, but we are going to be focusing very specifically on butterflies and bees. And uh, that is because uh, we, even within the pollinator and insect population, they are species that in some ways are more vital than others. And so we'll get into that a little bit um, as, we, as we progress here. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Um, these are statistics that have been in the newspaper, have been uh, you know, on TV where this is, some of this is not brand new news, but when you see it all in one place, it's pretty alarming. Um, it, it, we, we, we have lost nearly 2,900 in, this is North America, of our best known species of plants and animals um, that are at risk, not just of decline, but of extinction. 52% of our insects are in decline. The monarch population that we just love is down 96% from the numbers of monarchs that were in North America in the 70s. 432 species of birds that have declined in, at a perilous rate. A lot of this is related very directly to the fact that 47% of our native plants are in decline. Um, and 36 million trees uh, a year are, are disappearing from our cities. So these are the kind of uh, dangers that we, are, that we are looking at and that we wanna talk about a little bit more, particularly in relation to what does it mean to us as human beings? Does it really matter? 
Oh, yeah, it does matter. And here's why it matters. Because these Plants and insects provide ecological services that we often don't really give very much consideration to. We don't think about them very often. But if we didn't have the plants and we didn't have the insects, we really, as a human species, would not be sustained. Um, plants are the, the first generator of energy on the planet Earth through photosynthesis, they are taking the energy that they get from the sun, uh, the nutrition that they get from the soil, and they are beginning, they're the start of the food web. Um, whether that is uh, us eating uh, vegetables and fruits and leafy green things and taking the energy directly from a plant, or if that is taking it from an animal who ate an animal who ate an animal who ate an animal and we finally had a piece of chicken, um, that energy is, is what sustains us. Of course, we know that plants produce the oxygen that we breathe. And this is, um, this is a critical to our survival. Plants also clean our water as water uh, comes down in the form of rain, uh, it is processed through the root system of plants, it's cleansed and it, it slows its way down um, on its way into our rivers and streams and, and finally into the sea. Of great importance is the role that plants play in capturing carbon and uh, it, 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 it's drawn in through the photosynthesis and it is pumped into the ground and stored into the ground. And so the more plants and trees that we can put back onto the earth, uh, the more carbon um, it, can, it can pull. According to the US Forest Service data, trees offset 10 to 20% of US emissions from burning fossil fuels each year. So they're really a sponge for carbon. Uh, plants also build our topsoil and hold our soil in place through its root systems. And you know, all of this uh, sustaining of water and processing water is, is helping to prevent floods and erosion. We have also known for a long time that plants that are native to an area almost always uh, perform better at these ecological services than plants that have been introduced uh, and have not been native here. So now let's take a look at why does it matter about insects? Insects deliver 75, uh, pollinate 75% of, of the crops that we eat. Um, if we didn't have food, if we didn't have insects, we, we wouldn't have food. Um, they also pollinate 78 to 94% of the wild uh, flowering plants that are um, in, in uh, our forests and in our gardens. Um, as pollinators, they sustain the food and the plant uh, species. Insects also are the first transfer of the energy from plants to food. If you look at that little diagram, we've got a plant here that is eaten by a plant eating uh, insect, um, a caterpillar in this case, uh, and caterpillars are the, the largest eaters of, of plant leaves. And then the bird eats the plant and then the hawk, the big hawk eats the little the littler bird, and so on and so forth. Um, but it, it all starts with insects transferring that energy from uh, our plants. The most productive of our species and why we are focusing particularly on meeting the needs to bring caterpillars and native bees back into our gardens is that they, uh, because of uh, the roles that they play are very vital species. The caterpillars transfer more energy from plants than any other animals, and bees are the most productive um, pollinators. So 
just uh, to make sure you all understand where we're talking about these caterpillars coming from, I just want to quickly review this butterfly life cycle. A butterfly starts as a butterfly. Mama lays her eggs. The eggs hatch and become a caterpillar. Um, this is true of moths as well as butterflies. Um, it's also true of bees. Bees initially before they become a, a, an adult bee are a, a very small larva out of, a, out of an egg. Um, the butterfly pupates and then becomes an adult butterfly. This life cycle is very important in understanding uh, how we have to plant to uh, sustain butterflies in our gardens. But take a look at, at the importance of these caterpillars. Birds uh, use caterpillars as the primary food for their babies. 96% of North American birds rear their young on insects, primarily caterpillars. So through some research that has been done um, by uh, a, a woman named Desiree Narango, uh, she has looked at chickadees and has found that it takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to breed, to raise a small brood of chickadees. That's 350 to 570 caterpillars per day. So you begin to realize the importance of what caterpillars are to the bird population. If we didn't have caterpillars, we wouldn't have birds. Um, and there's a reason why they like caterpillars more than other insects. Very nutritious, very soft and easy to digest. Um, more nutritious actually than, than other insects. It's got fat and protein and, and carotenoids, which birds need for reproduction. Um, and the other important aspect of this is birds, when they're feeding a brood, will only travel maybe 50 meters from their nest. So they need to find those caterpillars very close to where that nest is. Um, so if we want those variety of birds um, in our gardens, um, and if we want to help those birds make their migrations as they travel north and south, um, we need to be uh, planting so that butterflies thrive and lots of caterpillars thrive. You know, we don't, we don't pay too much attention to caterpillars because we don't see a lot of them. So many of them are being uh, born up in, tree, in our treetops. Trees are our more prolific um, host for um, uh, butterflies, eggs, and larvae. So we don't see them when they're way up in the top of an oak tree, but they are there and um, the birds do find them. So now we know something about the importance of plants and we know something about the importance of insects. And then the other thing that's important to understand is the interrelationship and the interdependence that has evolved over millennial in, within a local ecosystem. And so this evolution has happened uh, to be mutually beneficial to both plants and insects. So very simply, plants wanna be pollinated because that's how they continue to, to live. So in order to do that, they develop all these little tricks to allure um, insects. They have pretty colors, they have wonderful uh, smells, they have delicious nectar, they have interesting shapes. And all of this is designed to invite specific insects to come to them. Now they also don't wanna be eaten up completely so that they die. So the other thing that they do is in their leaves, they uh, develop toxins, which a lot of insects don't like. And so that keeps the leaves and the plant from being totally destroyed by insects. But what has happened over time is that insects have learned how to uh, develop a, a, a digestive system and an immune system that will allow them to tolerate the toxins, but only on very specific plants. And so most plant eating insects 
have developed and own and can reproduce only on plants which they've shared this introduction or this evolutionary uh, history with. These are called host plants and, and these insects become specialists uh, and will only eat one type of, in, of plant. Um, so for instance, most of our caterpillars and moths, we have about 463 different types of moths and caterpillars in, or moths and butterflies in the state of Virginia. And they all produce a caterpillar. Well, most of those caterpillars are host plant specialists, which means mama will only lay her eggs on the leaf of the plant that that caterpillar can tolerate and will eat. And so if we don't have those plants, we don't have mama laying her eggs. And if she can't lay her eggs, she's not gonna stay around. She might, she might eat uh, a little bit of, of uh, pollen off of one of your tree, uh, your plants as an adult, but she will not lay her eggs um, where there are no host plants. And about 30% of our 400 native bees also are pollen specialists so that they must get pollen from certain plants. Who knew that pollen, or not, not all pollen is equal. And so um, these are important considerations to understand because it very much affects what we are going to plant in our gardens if we want to invite butterflies and native bees. For an ecosystem to stay healthy and functioning, we have to have both the native insects and the native plants, but they have to be in a sufficient number and diversity also. Um, it's not enough to just have one kind of plant, one kind of insect, if, if that ecosystem is to stay really functioning and robust. So we have to think about that. So what has caused this decline? Well, it's been a lot of things. So we're gonna look at a few of these things a little bit more specifically. Primarily, it has been habitat loss and fragmentation of what used to be their environments. Um, it, it has been loss of connectivity because of the fragmentation. Uh, it has been loss of native plants and that they have been substituted um, in, these, in these fragmented uh, quarter acre lots that we live on by a lot of introduced and invasive plants instead of native plants. Pesticide use has been extremely devastating. And um, climate change to the degree that if we don't have robust ecosystems, they are not going to be able to handle the changes that we are feeling in climate and the changes that we can expect to have ahead. So let's look a little bit at some of these things. So Doug Tallamy, by the way, for those of you who may not know him, is an entomologist uh, at the um, uh, University of Delaware, uh, a, a very highly respected um, uh, entomologist who has done a lot of research uh, with this, along with many, many other uh, local and national um, scientists. But he is saying now that we are living in a world uh, that's so, uh, uh, where it's so fragmented and isolated that this is one of the reasons that we're hemorrhaging these species. If you take a look at these two maps of our area, the one on the left shows, I don't, I, I couldn't nail a date on, on these maps, but it's, I'm gonna say within 50 years, um, maybe a little bit longer than that. But if you take a look on the left at all of the green space that we had that were forests that were undeveloped areas and you see how connected they all are and how vast they all are in comparison to these gray areas which is where there was uh, initial development and then you come over here and take a look at what uh, was probably 10 years ago and you see this little teeny bit of green that we have here running up through the middle 
and then little bits and pieces here that are our county parks. And you know, when we get in one of our parks, we think, oh, well, this is pretty big, but in comparison, it's not. And there is very, very little connectivity when you look at the greater picture. Now, when we drill down to the city of Falls Church and we take a look at the fragmentation of this environment now, where we have a few little green spaces that are our lovely parks, and I'm glad we have them, but there is no connectivity at all. And so uh, in some cases, these are spaces that are still not large enough, even though we're planting them with native plants, uh, they are not large enough to sustain the kind of ecosystem um, that is required. And so maybe the only help is for all of these little one quarter acre lots to do something about it. And so that is where we want uh, you all to focus a little bit. What used to look like this, this is what Falls Church looked like before all of that development. Unfortunately, now looks a lot like this. Okay, this is called a pollinator desert. And what it is, is a great big lawn with almost nothing in it, or it's hardscape, or it's just a few little foundation plantings. And there is nothing that lives in this kind of an environment in terms of a robust population of native bees, butterflies, insects, uh, any kind of wildlife. Um, now, we as homeowners need to join in and uh, take a look at what we can do about this. Thankfully, not all of Falls Church is like this, but um, again, according to Mr. Tallamy, he says that we are the last hope that human dominated landscapes, which is us, is the single most effective thing we can do to stop this steady stream of uh, species out of our local ecosystem by building what he is calling biological corridors. And so here are a couple of examples of some homeowners in Falls Church who already are through planting more native plants, um, building up an ecosystem uh, within their own backyard. And the idea is that if enough people do this, we can build what would be called a biological corridor. If I did it and then my next door neighbor did a little bit and then the whole block did something, we would, we would then have a way for butterflies and bees and insects to make their migrations, to uh, go from garden to garden and, and get the diversity of uh, host plants and pollen uh, that they need. Um, we already in the city of Falls Church have over 150 homeowners um, and most of our parks um, that have been designated as wildlife habitats. It's a program that we have been affiliated with since 2015 uh, with National Wildlife Federation. And uh, we are now considered a community wildlife habitat. Um, and you might see these signs around. We have just posted signs in all of our, our certified parks. Um, that show that it's a habitat. And you may see in peop some people's yards, if you, if you certify your yard as a habitat, you uh, can then buy a sign that states that. You don't have to, but you can. So that's what those signs mean, um, that there are uh, things going on in that garden that are meeting the needs of, uh, of wildlife and particularly our pollinators. 
I want you to be a little bit inspired. So I'm going to show you some of the properties in town and some of the transformations that people have made uh, in their gardens or their landscape. So this homeowner started out ha uh, having a house that was just almost nothing but ivy in the front of the house. And they took that ivy and pulled it out and now have replaced it with six or seven different varieties of um, uh, native plants, trees, shrubs. Another homeowner that had uh, replaced some lawn, oh, sorry, replaced some lawn um, and had built a bit, another bed. I'm sorry that that one, I don't know if I can get back to that. Um, there. Took some of the lawn and some very unproductive beds and built a beautiful native garden uh, bed that is blooming now in three seasons. Another backyard, this was a woodland backyard that was dominated by English ivy and a, an expanse of lawn. Uh, they eliminated some of the lawn, they pulled the ivy, and now they've planted uh, over here, you can see these beautiful Virginia uh, bluebells that are in bloom now and woodland poppies um, and made uh, a lovely setting. This home homeowner had uh, all lawn that was running down toward the back of their home and they took uh, all that lawn out and planted very uh, robust garden of native plants, built a stairway up the side of the hill, and then eventually, not in this picture, but over here you can see that they put a patio at the top of those stairs and still have a small area of lawn uh, because they have a dog and they needed a place for the dog to run. Um, but now they don't have water running down the hill. Uh, everything is very secured and very much um, a habitat. These homeowners, the one on the left, uh, planted native beds all around uh, the lawn. She got rid of maybe about half of her lawn and planted beds of native plants. And that's in bloom three seasons of the year. This is was in early spring and the, um, the ragwort is all in bloom. This homeowner didn't want any lawn. And so she has densely planted native leaves, native plants, uh, or native trees, perennials. And I've been in this garden and this garden is alive all year long. Okay. So there are four things that wildlife and particularly our pollinators need in your garden if you are going to invite them in. So we're going to talk a little bit about these four things. Um, I'm not going to concentrate so much tonight on food. We have already talked about the need for the larval food and the adult food. They are two different kinds of plants, two different kinds of food. The larva are going to eat leaves and the adult is going to eat pollen. Um, but we will spend all of the next talk uh, focusing very much on that, um, but we'll, I'll talk just a little bit about it. And then we're, we're going to look at water, shelter, uh, and a place to nest and raise young. I want to just give a definition. We're talking a lot about native plants. What is a native plant? So a native plant by this definition is one that has evolved over geologic time and it has responded to and thrived in local climate, soil, the rainfalls, drought, frost. It's learned to live where it is and it has learned to uh, interact with the species that are native uh, in terms of animals, uh, animals, other plants, insects. Um, they have evolved without any human intervention. Nobody brought them here. Nobody planted them here. And so for North America, we're talking probably about the period of when we first, when the Europeans first arrived in the 1560, 1560s. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about something called an, an introduced plant. 
So an introduced plant is one that is, is not native to a specific location. It did not start here. It was brought here um, by somebody else. So it needed some kind of human intervention to, to arrive here. And then an invasive plant uh, is one that has been introduced here and has thrived to the point that it is overtaking our native plants. And so we see, we see evidence of this along our highways, even along the bike path. Um, before they started tearing the bike path up here, you could see all of the mile a minute and the, uh, you know, all of the invasive plants, the, the, even English ivy is very invasive, um, that have um, really taken over and have left little room uh, for native plants to thrive. I just want to stress again the importance of our native plants, again, because of the relationship between uh, these evolutionary uh, uh, codependencies that they have developed. Um, and most of these host plants are native plants. Almost all are native plants. Uh, we have it, an introduced plant does not become a host. Um, so, um, we're going to keep stressing and trying to get you more familiar with native plants um, because of their importance. Um, they are also important for native bees. Um, we, as I said, we have about 30% of our bees that require the plant, the pollen of certain plants because of the nutritional value in those, in that pollen and because uh, they need it for, for the ability to reproduce. So I'm gonna show you just a few uh, native plants, um, just to show you the variety, the beauty, the color uh, of some of our very popular ones. Uh, all of these plants are also host plants uh, and most of them are also nectar plants. And that's the other beauty of so many native plants is that they serve more than one purpose. They're not just providing a pollen, but in many cases, they're also providing the ability to be a host plant. They come in a lot of colors. They are suited to many different locate, you know, types of location, types of soil. You're going to be able to find native plants that can go in shade, in sun, uh, in wet places, in dry places. Uh, they are very adaptive to many uh, locations. Now, I just want to share with you what a native plant will look like once the insects find it. This is a swamp milkweed that I planted right outside of my patio last summer. And it was alive all summer long between the monarchs who, this mama looks like she is there just taking nectar. Uh, but it's quite possible that she's laid eggs on this plant. And then the, um, the bees that are uh, foraging on the uh, pollen and the nectar. Whoop. Okay, let's talk about water. We need to supply or think about how could we put some water sources in our gardens? So we can look at a pond, but not everybody has room for a pond. That's lovely. Um, but there are many other smaller and more practical ways um, if we don't have a pond. Bird baths are lovely. Um, it's good sometimes to put a stone in a bird bath, uh, like the slide on the left, um, because it gives a place for a bird to perch to reach the water. Um, the upper slide shows uh, a, a, a bird bath or a, a bird bath with a little sprinkler in it, and they they love that. Uh, hummingbirds especially love that if you can make water uh, move a little bit. Uh, the lower left shows again an idea of just a saucer, but this one I put just small stones in because it makes it easier for the insects to actually get to the water. So here I have a B 
me or wasp, I can't quite tell, um, drinking out of that saucer. Um, another thing that butterflies very much need in addition to water are soil minerals. And so here are a couple of ways that you can offer that. Um, on the, the right, you see butterflies, and these are probably male butterflies. This is usually something male butterflies do. Um, that uh, is just uh, in a slight indentation in the soil. And when the dew will come uh, overnight, these butterflies are doing what is called puddling. And so they're just taking up some of the moisture and in the soil are taking up some of the minerals. Um, and so you can do this by just leaving some bare soil, some open place where uh, butterflies could puddle. Or in the upper left, uh, this shows something that looks like, I don't know, like a cake pan almost, that you can put down into uh, the garden bed and fill it with um, contractor sand. This is sand that's got some, still some stone or pebble in it. Um, not the kind of sandbox sand that you'd put in a kid's sandbox and fill it so that it's got water, but it's not sitting water. Uh, and then that little branch at the top gives it a little bit of a perch, but that's another place where um, a butterfly could come and get both water and soil. We need to provide shelter. Uh, in, uh, our, our pollinators need shelter to get out of bad weather. They need shelter to get away from predators. Uh, they need shelter sometimes to get out of the sun. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that provide shelter. Just having uh, shrubs and undergrowth in uh, maybe a part of your yard around a tree. Uh, if you have any native grasses, uh, you can uh, leave those up all winter. Don't cut them back until early spring uh, because they can provide a place for um, animals to uh, shelter, for birds to shelter, uh, even for some insects to shelter uh, uh, over uh, the winter. Uh, leave as much what we call ground litter uh, as you can in your beds. Uh, don't feel like you have to clean those beds out in the fall because uh, most of our butterflies, when they pupate, they don't stay up on the, on the plants. They fall down into the leaf litter and may be wintering over that. Um, a little bit of, uh, of these kind of sticks and branches leave a little pile of them. This is a place where native bees may nest. It's a place where uh, it can provide shelter also just by having little spaces to crawl into. Shelter can be a tree. Shelter can be a, a bigger pile of brush. Um, you know, I don't compost things that are more than maybe a, the size of my pinky finger, but I always keep a brush pile out in the back uh, as, a, as a place where maybe um, bumblebees may nest in there, um, or I might have a chipmunk that wants to live in there. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a, a good thing if you can find a place to leave a little bit of brush or even a little pile of rocks in your leaf litter. These all are places where you can simply uh, provide some shelter. And then places to nest and raise their young. So we've already talked about the importance with butterflies of providing the host plants that are necessary for their larvae, for their caterpillars. Um, but in addition to that, we need places for our birds to nest. And we need places particularly for our native bees to nest. You know, we don't, we don't talk a lot about our native bees and people don't realize how important our native bees are. Few things you should know. Native bees don't sting. The males don't even have stingers. The only way you would ever get bitten by a native bee is if you grabbed it, uh, but as long as it is feeding um, or nesting, it doesn't, 
it, it, it is not going to be aggressive toward you. Um, our native bees nest as solitary insects. Um, our bumblebees will form little colonies, but our native bees just form individual nests. They're solitary. 70% uh, of our native bees nest in the ground. So the picture on the lower right will show you what a native bee nest might look like. And the mama bee will go down and she will just build little egg chambers down there and plant her, uh, plant her eggs in there with, uh, with uh, enough pollen uh, so that when the eggs hatch, there is something for the larva to eat. And then they will emerge out of there as bees. The, the picture in the center and on the left uh, are where the other 30% of our native bees nest, and that is in cavities. So the one on the far left is just nesting in a hollow stem. Uh, so this is another, it's a good idea in the fall to not cut your, your stems back to the ground, leave them so that maybe um, our, our bees can nest in them. The one in the middle is a log that just has some holes drilled in it. Um, and those holes would be used by our native bees to go in and lay their egg chambers also. So those are, the, those are some ideas about the four things that you would think about uh, incorporating in some way into your gardens um, if you are starting to get inspired about trying to invite some more uh, of our native bees, our, our native butterflies, um, and our wildlife in general uh, back into your gardens and helping to create these biological corridors. So it might take some, I want to call it old habits that we have, ways that we've been doing gardening for years and we probably don't even think about it. So we're going to talk about those, there are four of them that I want to hit on. So our first one is the old habit we have of just buying for beauty. You know, we go down to Maryfield or Meadow Farms or, uh, you know, one of the, the, um, the Home Depot store and we look at all the beautiful plants that are out there and we think about just buying for the color we want or the shape we want. And maybe we don't give very much thought to what productivity other than it looking pretty that this plant might provide. And that's the habit that we have to get over. We have to start making our buying decisions and our planting decisions on putting plants in our gardens that are productive and that have function other than just that they look nice. Um, unfortunately, most of what we have to choose from are not native plants. And so this takes education. It takes knowing where you can go and find native plants. And we're gonna be able to help you with all of that. That is one of the purposes that Amy and I have is to, um, to getting you more comfortable uh, and more knowledgeable and more excited about what native plants can do. Um, it is not that you need to get rid of all the introduced plants. We all have the plants we love, you know, and I have them in my garden as well. But it is the introduction of native plants that is what are going to bring the pollinators back. Um, you can plant all the introduced plants that you want and you may get, you may get some bees buzzing around for some pollen. Um, and you might see an occasional butterfly, but you're not going to have the kind of biodiversity and the kind of robust ecosystem that you could have um, by just choosing slightly different types of plants. And it may only start with one or two things. It may only start with a tree, but just think about starting somewhere. Old habit number two, we love our lawns. Now, maybe we don't love them. Maybe we actually think, oh, they're a lot of work, but we've got them, we, they were there when we bought the house. You know, we just haven't done anything about it. 
Um, but uh, I just want you to be aware that there is no plant that is less productive than grass. Um, we're not, you're not alone. There are over 40 million acres of turf grass in the United States. It's the size of new, all of New England. So, you know, we're not alone. It's what our properties have become, unfortunately. Um, but they are the least productive of any plant we could put in our, in our landscape. Um, in comparison to uh, native plants and trees, uh, they don't produce as much oxygen. They don't do the same job of um, processing our water and cleaning our water. As a matter of fact, a lot of water just runs off of grass. It is not, um, because it has a very shallow root system, it's not as, uh, uh, the roots aren't as, as deep. And so uh, they don't do the same good processing of, of the water and cleaning it. They don't store carbon like trees and shrubs and native plants do. So they're not giving us any kind of real ecological um, function. Um, and yet it's what most of our landscapes are. So we have to rethink that a little bit. We're not saying get rid of all of your lawn. Lawns serve a purpose besides ecological. You know, we need a place for the kids to play. We need a place for the badminton net. We need a place for the dog to run. That is all still possible, um, but I'd like to see if you could think a little bit about where or how you might get rid of some lawn. And here are some examples of ways that people have done that. Uh, the two pictures on the left show beds that have just over time been developed to eliminate lawn and to fill it in instead with native plants and trees. Um, so you might think about something like that. And again, it's starting small and building from there. This takes time, it takes money, it takes intent. Um, the pictures on the right show some pretty well-developed gardens that have run up uh, drive, the sides of driveways and encroached into the lawns, uh, or that have shown beds that have just been built um, around lawns rather than taking them all the way to the property line, um, building in with um, some beautiful native plants. Or you might just start with the hell strip. Here are a couple of pictures of um, what people have done, just doing a little bit of native planting on the hell strip in front of your house. Um, that is, you know, these native plants are very tolerant of, in a lot of cases, of salt, of uh, drought, of they don't need a lot of water. So they are, there, there are many of them that are plants that could do very well in this kind of a situation. And then the one on the bottom left, just showing again, starting small, if nothing more than planting an understory tree, or if you have the room to think about planting something that 50, that, that 50 years from now may be 50 feet high, uh, you know, a beautiful oak or uh, some other kind of beautiful shade tree. Um, so just some ideas to inspire you and to get you thinking about how you might take an unproductive lawn and make some of it a little bit more productive. Relying on pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides. In order to keep our lawns beautifully green and weed free, and to keep our introduced plants um, healthy, we rely way, way too much on pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides. And there is nothing more deadly to pollinators than those chemicals. Um, when we talk about pesticides, 40% of the chemicals that lawn companies use to keep our lawns green and weed free are banned as carcinogens in other countries, in a lot of European countries. 
75 studies have documented the connection between lawn pesticides and lymphoma. Fertilizers, according to the EPA, 40 to 60% of the fertilizers that we apply to our lawns end up on surface water and groundwater. So it's coming into our aquaflora and the water we drink, and it's running into our streams and killing the fish. So I just can't say enough about how important it is to figure out how to not rely on these. You know, a lawn that has clover and, and um, violets um, and a few what we call weeds, it, 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 it is at least doing something. And um, so anyway, um, I'd like you to, to, to really think about uh, what happens uh, in your use of these. Often in our introduced plants, when we get a bug or some little infestation, uh, we immediately go and we get some kind of a bug spray, we don't even know what it is, and start spraying. You know, if you wait, um, nature will take care of some of this. I wanna show you a couple of pictures here. So up in the right, we have a praying mantis. Right. If we uh, if we allow insects into our garden and don't kill them first with insecticides and pesticides, uh, they will take care of their own. Right. So praying mantis uh, is a generalist. It will eat all kinds of insects. Uh, the picture on the bottom right or the bottom left, I'm sorry, is a tomato worm. Now I get these every year in my garden, in my on my tomato plants, and a tomato worm, you know, if it's not taken care of, it can it can eat a lot of leaves in no time at all. But I give it 24 hours, and every single year, after at least within 24 hours, my tomato worm looks like this picture, and what that picture is are the eggs of a parasitic wor uh, uh, a parasitic wasp who has come, she has laid her eggs on the back of that tomato worm. Those eggs will hatch, larva will eat into the tomato worm and kill it from the inside out. From the minute those eggs are laid, that tomato worm does no more damage to my tomato plant. Nature taking its course. The ladybug, ladybugs are vacuum cleaners for aphids. So rather than spraying all the aphids off of a plant, uh, let a few aphids be there. We have to learn to live with, uh, live with nature. And then uh, the ladybugs will come in and, and, and clean them up. Now, you know, there are times when the infestation may get so bad that something has to be done, but there are many biological ways and non-chemical ways. And I think Amy's probably gonna talk a little bit about that um, in our final talk about, you know, ways that we can control uh, without using pesticides. And our last, um, our last old habit is, we may not realize it, but we're wasting a lot of money. We're wasting money on water. We're wasting money on the chemicals and the things that we put on our lawns. We spend $60 million a year in the United States on fertilizers and chemicals to keep our lawns weed free and green. In the East, 30% of the water we use in the summer is used to water lawns, 30%. In the US on average, more than 8 billion gallons of water a day are used watering lawns. So this is an enormous waste of a resource um, that is in many parts of the United States in big trouble. Um, so another reason to think about maybe less lawn and more native plants because native plants don't have that same requirement. They're used to living in our climate where we have dry, uh, dry summers or where we have times of a lot of rain or where we have clay soil. They're used to living in this growing environment. Uh, one word about spraying for mosquitoes. 
This is like taking uh, $10 bills and just tearing them up out in the front lawn. These services have become very prolific in this area and there's very little we can do about them and they're not really solving the problem. Um, what, what most people don't understand is that the real problem with mosquitoes is the standing water that we have on our properties that we don't even realize are there. Water that's sitting in a, in a dish, water that's even sitting in a bottle cap. Um, and uh, what is happening is these sprays may be, skill, may be killing some adult mosquitoes, um, but they are killing everything else. They're killing all, uh, these are so, this is so toxic to uh, our butterflies and our pollinators. Even the organic methods that they talk about, they are organic for humans and maybe the dog, but they are not, uh, they are extremely harmful to our butterflies and, and mosquitoes. So the, the, our butterflies and, and, um, and bees. The best way to control the mosquitoes is at the larval stage, not the adult stage. And uh, one of the ways that you can do that is to just take a bucket of water, throw some straw in it, and those, those mama mosquitoes will come and they'll lay their eggs in there and you get something down at Brown's Hardware called a dunk, a mosquito dunk. You put that in the bucket and that will, that's a, a natural larva side. It will kill the mosquito larva and then they never turn into, uh, into adults. So um, we know that there's not a lot we can do about these companies, but I prevail upon you uh, to think twice about using them because uh, this is really, really dangerous to our pollinators. And uh, here's another thing you can do. We spend a lot of money every year on mulch and on compost, and you can make your own. Um, you can make it by composting grass clippings, leaves, and garden trimmings. Um, we do composting workshops in the city, and uh, they are free, and you can come to those. Um, this uh, compost is the best thing that you can put on your soil to make it healthy and uh, you don't have to use a lot of chemical fertilizers. Um, you can do all this work for free. So we'll share that. So how to start being an intentional gardener. What we'd like you to do as a first step uh, is to take a look at your property, go out and see what you've already got there. What plants do you already have? Um, do you have any native plants? Do you have any native trees? What's already there? Um, are there any plants that you don't even know why you have them that maybe you could get rid of um, that, that would give you room to uh, plant something that would be maybe a little bit more productive in terms of bringing pollinators? Uh, do you have any invasive plants that need to be removed um, that could be replaced with something that's productive? Uh, where could you plant a native tree? Any place in your yard that you, could, um, that you could do that? And is there any part of your lawn that could be transformed into a pollinator bed like some of the pictures that we saw earlier? So, this is how to start. It all starts with assessing your property. You have to start small and build it over time. And if everybody did that, you know, we would start having these wonderful corridors of um, native plants and pollinator gardens that would be um, robust and just bring so much more life back to us. So there are some online resources that I'm going to suggest to you and that will um, 
we'll send information out about these as well. But um, plants that are resources that will help you identify native plants, talk to you about um, the needs of the native plants, what grows in the sun, what grows in the shade, what needs a lot of water, what can, dr what can grow in a dry, uh, dry location. Couple of more. Um, and these, uh, most of these can be downloaded for free. Uh, once you, once we give you, we're going to give you the websites for these. And then the last thing that I will offer is because the City of Falls Church is certified as a um, community wildlife habitat, um, you can actually go and uh, certify your own garden as a wildlife habitat. Uh, it's a self-certification that you can get through National Wildlife Federation. Uh, and it gives you a chance to identify in your garden what you have that is good for food, water, shelter, and a place for nesting and raising young. Uh, there's a $20 certification fee, but you also get a one-year subscription to the National Wildlife Federation magazine. It's a lovely magazine. And you can get 10% off on other things from the National Wildlife uh, catalogs at um, bird baths, nesting boxes, theaters, things like that. Um, and they're, they're doing some kind of a promotion now where you, if you certify and you buy a sign similar to this sign that I have in my garden here, um, you can get 20% off. So um, uh, that would be something that you could be taking advantage of um, right now. So with that, I will end uh, this first talk and open it up to questions or comments. Um, and uh, I think maybe between Amy and I, we, we can address these. Great. Well, I'm going to, uh, we've got the questions pulled up here, Sandy, and I'm going to start with the first one, which is kind of a two-part question. Okay. Uh, the first more generally, what can you plant if you have a balcony? And then following up on that, you know, is milkweed an option to help maybe attract monarchs? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, so uh, many of these native plants um, are, are, are plants that you can put on a, on a, a balcony. Um, some of them need more sun than others. So it would depend a little bit on um, the sun, you know, how much sun you get. Um, a lot of these plants uh, are, a lot of native plants are beginning to be a little bit more available uh, in places like Maryfield and Meadow Farms and some of our local um, nurseries. Um, Green Spring Gardens in Annandale on the Annandale Alexandria line uh, also has a wonderful um, uh, plant nursery where they sell native plants. Um, so yes, you can do this on a balcony. And uh, the second part of it was uh, milkweeds. Yes, specifically, um, can milkweeds help attract monarchs? Absolutely. Um, I, I, for my garden, personally prefer swamp milkweed, which was the one that I showed the picture of that had the monarch butterfly flying around it. Um, it is a plant that grows to be about maybe three feet tall. It needs sun. Um, milkweed does need sun. Um, and uh, another one is called uh, butterfly weed, but um, it, is a, it is smaller, it is bright orange, it's a beautiful plant, and both of those will um, uh, are larval food for monarchs. Um, so uh, the common milkweed um, it's also a very good plant, but you need space for that. It, it, can, it can really spread. Um, and so that's why I recommend the first, uh, the first two that I mentioned. I don't, Amy, maybe do you have anything to add to that? 
I would say anything that's in the um, mint family is always a good um, choice for a, uh, a container. <laughs> so um, yep. Monarda didyma, which is the red um, flower that you saw in Sandy's uh, presentation that had the, the uh, hummingbird coming to it. Monarda didyma is a great one. The mountain mints or the canthemums are nice. Um, you you want to try to avoid a plant that has that will send out a deep tap root of any kind. So mints are good. Things that would um, spread by rhizome would be good in a container because they don't have deep, deep, deep roots that they would get you know um, sort of strangled in the in the container. Yeah, if um, we're we're going to send out um, a list after this of. Um, some of those websites that we showed pictures of where you can download their cattle their uh, what's well, kind of it's not really a catalog but their their booklet and some of these booklets are you know 20 or 30 pages long but they're loaded with pictures of native plants and they give a lot of description of um whether they need sun or shade or uh they're they're a wealth of information and very important to you know, have as a resource. Yeah, and the a Plant Nova Natives book in particular, in the back of it, it has different sections for different kinds of landscaping issues. So one of the one of the sections is about container plants. What kinds of plants would be great in containers, particularly like certain kinds of shrubs and so forth too. Okay, we had another question, and I. Uh, I know you briefly spoke about mosquitoes, but someone asked, how do you avoid being inundated with mosquitoes if you have a water source in your yard? Well, if you have something like a bird bath or even the, the ones that we showed of um, a saucer with a rock in the middle of it, you know, sort of sitting up on a, 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 a wall, you just have to keep the water um, refreshed every couple of days. Um, if you've got a pond, I guess you have to put these mosquito dunks in it. Um, but um, if you're just doing, um, you know, a saucer or a bird bath, you just have to replenish the water. And if I'm going to go away for a few days, I empty it. I mean, there will be times when it's better to have no water in it than to leave it and have it, you know, get full of uh, mosquito larva. And the other thing Sandy showed was, um, I guess they're called bubblers. They're little um, uh, solarized um, things that you can put into a, a bird bath that sprays the water up or keeps the water moving. So if, yeah. you, if you've got moving water, and particularly when you have a pond, usually that's something that they recommend that you have something that keeps the water aerated and, and moving a bit, which helps a lot to disrupt mosquitoes. But if you're having mosquito issues, it usually means that you've got water somewhere that you're not really very aware of. And oftentimes it's going to be your gutters <laughs> or <laughs> it is a neighbor has, you know, a pot that's gotten filled with water just sitting. Sometimes when you walk around, you realize you have little things that can collect water. And as she mentioned, they only need about a dime sized amount of water for mosquitoes to land and lay, you know, hundreds of eggs in there. So kind of doing the checking through everything and, and turning everything over and uh, keeping your gutters clean, um, that really helps a lot. Another problem is a lot of times people when they, at the, at the end of your downspout, if you're not using rain barrels and things like that, if your downspout uh, doesn't completely drain and if it's touching the ground and actually starts to kind of turn back up, then the water, there's water sitting down in the, at the bottom of that bottom point. Again, something that you won't see the water, but if you go around and start to really investigate, you'll find, you might find little spots that you can, you know, fix. Great. All right. Uh, the next question, which kind of follows up a little bit um, on some of the information you gave about uh, planting on balconies, but any advice for people with townhomes that have small front yards and a patio in the back? Are there suggestions for getting the biggest bang of your buck for the small square footage? Well, some of it will depend on what your homeowners association will allow you to do. Um, 
you know, if you could plant the whole front yard, that would be fine with me um, and just not have any grass. But, um, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of it depends on what restrictions you might have at, with a homeowner. I would say on a patio that you can do as you can do an awful lot with pots. Um, there, there is no reason why you can't plant all kinds of native plants that are going to attract the pollinators um, by using um, by using pots and just putting native plants in them. Um, and then you you know if you're if they're on your patio, they're close enough for you to really enjoy seeing as well. You know you can they they, they will come. It, it it's very true what they say. If you plant it, they will come. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the delights of, of trying to do this sort of wildlife gardening um, because it happens. But the other thing too is if you're frustrated about getting plants because it can be a little bit, it can be a little difficult sometimes if you miss the plant sales um, or you don't have time to get out to one of the local um, native nurseries. And we have a few now, They're, they seem to be expanding every year we get a new one. But um, if you're having trouble, remember too that um, many herbs, many introduced plants like salvias, uh, a number of herbs um, are attractive to insects. Um, so even if you did more of an herb garden type of thing, you would also be providing some nectar. Um, and in a, in a tight space in pots, if you wanna at least try that out, that's often for probably the least expensive way to go is to go grab some, you know, $3 herbs, <laughs> throw them in pots and start that, start creating that um, scenario in your backyard and start substituting in other things over time. So we had a question, how do native plants spread slash propagate year over year? Every sort of way. Some of them are rhizomes, some of them are seeds. Um, it, it, it depends on the plant. Um, this is why some native plants actually are, uh, can get a little bit invasive just because uh, uh, you know, they will spread by, by uh, very often by rhizome. Um, so it, it, it's really all over the lot. Um, I don't know, Amy, would you wanna add anything to that? It... Yeah, I mean, you're right. She, uh, they spread by rhizome. So like I mentioned the mints before, that's definitely one that people often say you either want to plant it up next to some kind of hardscape. So you have at least two, a couple of edges that it won't go in those directions. And pots are a wonderful way to keep the mints contained. Um, some, there are some plants that are, um, you know, their seed is windblown. So the, the, um, the grasses, the, the milk, the milkweed and the grasses, those plant, those get into your neighbor's yard, which, oops, well, that happens, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they do spread in multiple kinds of ways. Um, and even our violets, which are, you know, considered by the, um, the uh, agro-industrial complex as weeds, um, our native violets are spread by ants taking the seed and moving them around our, our yards. So uh, yeah, there's multiple ways that they, will, that they will move. Our next question is, is there a use for a strip of grass or lawn around the house to act as a buffer between human residences and native landscapes? They're specifically thinking of uh, as a defense against ticks basically. You mean if, if, if they're backing up to a wooded area or? I think they're referring to, um, you know, the sidewalk uh, that people walk down, you know, in front of a home, having, you know, if they have a lot of taller or you know, overhanging tree or uh, brush, things like that, that potentially ticks could get onto people when they're just walking through the neighborhood. I don't hear about that being a very big problem. Uh, you know, if we're talking about planting along like a, a hell strip, um, you know, the, the ticks are coming, the ticks that we really worry about, the deer ticks, they're only coming when there's deer. I mean, we're not, 
we don't we don't have a problem with those kind of ticks if we don't have deer on our property. Um, so I don't I, I don't know if we're getting at the question that was asked, but or potentially maybe I misunderstood it. Relooking at it, um, maybe it's more: is there a use for a strip of grass between the home and uh, and whatever garden um, oh. as a as a layer between? It look, I look specifically like they're talking about ticks. Mm. Well, I, I, I would say that, you know, uh, rethinking your lawn, you can use your lawn as pathway. So if you want, like she showed a couple of photos where, um, you know, they created new beds and there was a, just a little piece of lawn between the, bat, the, the two beds that you could walk on. And if you've already got lawn, that's actually a great, way to just construct an interesting path using that lawn and that's all you would mow. You don't necessarily need the lawn to, if you've got a lot of native plants in the beds, what you're worried about with ticks is really when you've got like a lot of, you know, um, unmowed tall uh, fescues and grasses and things that um, where you don't have what I would call a very healthy um, biodiverse group of plants, but you have is like, you know, just a lot of tall grass, like you have in a weed lot, right? So um, I don't think you're going to have that issue because if you've got a lot of other kinds of plants going on, you're going to have a more diverse group of insects. And so that should, you should have what's in the, in the parlance known as integrated pest management going on. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you, yeah, I don't think you will have to worry about that, but certainly I know if you're in a, in a situation where you have a home and you back up to a big woods and you've got a lot of big tall grasses and you know, there are deer, well, there are deer now around here too. So, you know, sometimes they're even in your yard, but um, you know, that, that, the lawn itself having that strip of grass is not going to be the thing that's going to prevent you know it's more like you your dog rolling in the in the leaves or your kids you know rolling around in the grass and that sort of stuff being right into that thicket of of uh, high grass that's going to get the you uh, more susceptible to the to the ticks but i don't i don't i think i understand what you're saying but i i don't think it's um really a the grass itself is necessarily a buffer. Um, but if you are worried about those kinds of things, you know, and you want to have a brush pile, definitely put it back toward the back of your lot, you know, or to the back of your house uh, fence line where uh, you can allow things to happen there, but you're not going to be interacting with it on a, any kind of regular basis. Okay, I think that was our last question. Um, so, Thank you again to Sandy Tarpinian and Amy Crumpton for that incredibly informative presentation. Um, we'll be sending a quick follow-up email next week with some suggested reading uh, for anyone who would like to dig a bit deeper, um, as well as a link to uh, tonight's program, a recording of tonight's program, and uh, some of the links that were presented um, in the uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Um, and uh, everyone who signed up for tonight's program should automatically receive a new Zoom link for session two, Make Way for the Pollinators, which is scheduled for Thursday, May 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, we will again send that Zoom link the day before the program. So just look for uh, an email from me similar to what you received yesterday. So thanks again. I'm going to stop the recording and that should uh, end tonight's program. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, it was Thank wonderful. You. Thank you.